Well, good evening. We um, are continuing our study on the heart of the matter, the um, Christian's attitude. We got the charts going there, brother? All righty. And um, tonight we're going to look at the Christian's attitude toward death and some things that the Bible has to say about this that hopefully can help us and comfort us and instruct us. And before we begin, Brother Joey is going to lead us in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask you at this time that you, you help us to focus on this class. We thank you so much for the blessings you've given us to be able to be here to study together. We ask that as we, we study tonight that we'll be able to take these things and apply them to our lives to help us to have better attitudes toward the things in our lives that you'll help us to focus every day on those things, to take inventory every day of how we act and how we react and how we are around we are to each other. We ask that you'll help us to be that light to the world. We ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. So I thought about how to start this discussion, and I just thought maybe this would be a good way to to get going with it. What makes death so difficult? What makes it so difficult? Yes, Tom? The unknown. The unknown. Okay, right. I mean, none of us have gone through it. We haven't experienced it personally, and it's not like you can practice this. So it's, it's going to be a new experience for us when we do go through actual death. All right, the unknown. What else? What makes this so difficult for us? Right. That's true. Yeah, so you walk through a cemetery, you, you see names of people you knew in life, and you know that it's only a matter of time before your name's going to be on that marker. So the loss of time on earth, I guess, is what that reflects. That's difficult, Bill. The final act is the thing that you have. Right. The final act that we have on earth, that's correct. I mean, that, that's it. I mean, <laughs> you, you're only here for a little bit in life under the sun. And once you leave, you know, that's it. I mean, the, your, your time here, your experiences here will end and then another generation comes. You know, and it's just been going like that for thousands of years. So we're here but for a moment. All right, what else? Anything else that makes it difficult? Yes. Blake. What's up, brother? <laughs> Not Dylan. Blake. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Right. That's correct. So the term death is separation. When the spirit separates from the body, the body is dead. So that whole process of separation is, you know, again, a very difficult thing for us to comprehend, especially when it's spiritual. You know, when you have spiritual death, which is, which is what we all want to avoid. So I, I was on the same wavelength as you. I, I thought of this one or came across, you know, the idea of how it's contrary to our instinct. You know, built within us, there's a program that you just want to live. You're a survivor. You know, that's how you got here. Is you're a survivor. And the will to live is there in most living beings. And it's certainly true of us. So, yeah, the pain, you know, the loss of life, loss of relationships, loss of time here then the unknown you know it's not like you again you can't practice this uh, it's it's going to happen and it's going to be a new encounter for you okay it's so permanent correct right and it's and that's what's really bad is that's what's so hard is we can't really see that about how on the other side of all this is eternity. Eternity. Sir? 
That's true, too. You don't know when this is going to happen. That's a good point. You don't know when it's going to. I mean, who's, who's going to die tonight? We don't know, right? We all know that. We all know that it can happen at any moment. All right, so since that is the case, you know, how can death be a blessing? That'd be something to think about. How can death be a blessing? And I think the Bible addresses this, you know, in, in terms of a practical sense and then a spiritual sense, okay? There's a practical aspect in thinking about death and how it's actually good for us. It really is. And really, spiritually, it is good for us so we can go and be with the Lord. But it's hard for us to always remember that. In a practical sense, that's what Solomon points out in Ecclesiastes 7, where he's saying, you know, you got to look at the better experience. What's better for you mentally and in your perception in life? And he says in verse 1, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now, he says, now follow me here. you got to follow me in this vein of thought because we all celebrate the birth of a child. And that's a beautiful day. But he's saying, actually, it's better for you to go to the funeral home than for you to be at the maternity ward or a birthday party. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. So what's he saying there? Better to go to the house of the morning than the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Take what to heart? Take what to heart? Say it again. The fact that you're going to die one day, exactly. That you're, you're confronted with mortality at a funeral. And we're all looking at it eyeball to eyeball when we go to pay our respects to somebody who's passed. Well, it's not like they're different from you. They just have gone through it before. You're going to go through it, given enough time. So the living take it to heart that we see that there's a limit to this, a limit to time for us. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made wiser or made better. So how can a sad countenance make you better? A sad countenance makes you better. In what sense? Sober thoughts. Sober thoughts. Okay, what, like what? What do you mean by that? Okay. Mm -hmm. You're looking at reality. All right, you're focused on reality. Okay. You know, and then, you know, that's why some look at Ecclesiastes as a man who's being very pessimistic. And he's not. He's not being pessimistic. He's just dealing with reality. But he says, look, it's good for you to have those moments of sobriety. Because when we think, hey, there's just no limit. You know, I get to do what I want. There's going to be another tomorrow, another tomorrow, another tomorrow. And there's no wisdom in living like that because you're not focusing on your accountability. And again, the, the limit, limitation you have here. The heart of the wise... The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So in a real practical sense, there's a benefit in looking at death and really getting near to it. Going through the valley of the shadow of death, it's good for you. If you respond to it properly, as this passage is pointing out. Yeah, that your end is getting closer too, that's true. Yeah, that we're all drifting down this river. You know, we each have our own boat or canoe or whatever, raft, and we're all drifting, you know, and it's going to end. Eventually, it's going to end for us. Some people zoom by. <laughs> they, they end it faster than we do, but we're all going to end it. We're all going to meet our end. But see, it's healthy to look at death. It's not healthy to ignore it, and it's not healthy to... You know, look at it as something that is a curse in terms of our outlook. There's, there's a way to look at it and benefit and profit from it. 
I came across an answer online. Uh, somebody responding to somebody who posted, my friend just died, I don't know what to do. You know, a lot of, a lot of comments to that. But then there was this one old guy's response that kind of just stood out. And he said, all right, here goes. I'm old. What that means is that I've survived so far. And a lot of people I've known and loved did not. I've lost friends, best friends, acquaintances, co-workers, grandparents, mom, relatives, teachers, mentors, students, neighbors, and a host of other folks. I have no children, and I can't imagine the pain it must be to lose a child. But here's my two cents. I wish I could say you get used to people dying. I never did. I don't want to. It tears a hole through me wherever somebody, whenever somebody I love dies, no matter the circumstances, but I don't want it to not matter. I don't want it to be something that just passes. My scars are a testament to the love and the relationship that I had for and with that person. And if the scar is deep, so was the love. So be it. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are a testament that I can love deeply and live deeply and be cut or even gouged. And that I can heal and continue to live and continue to love. And the scar tissue is stronger than the original flesh ever was. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are only ugly to people who can't see. As for grief, you'll find it comes in waves. When the ship is first wrecked, you're drowning the wreck, the wreck with wreckage all around you. Everything floating around you reminds you of the beauty and the magnificence of the ship that was and is no more. And all you can do is float. You find some piece of wreckage and you hang on for a while. Maybe it's some physical thing. Maybe it's a happy memory or a photograph. Maybe it's a person who is also floating. For a while, all you can do is float. Just stay alive. In the beginning, the waves are 100 feet tall and crash over you without mercy. They come 10 seconds apart. Don't even give you time to catch your breath. All you can do is hang on and float. After a while, maybe weeks, maybe months, you'll find that the waves are still 100 feet tall, but they come further apart. When they come, they still crash all over you and wipe you out. But in between, you can breathe. You can function. You never know what's going to trigger the grief. It might be a song, a picture, a street intersection, the smell of a cup of coffee. It can be just about anything, and the waves come crashing. But in between waves, there is life. Somewhere down the line, and it's different for everybody, you find that the waves are only 80 feet tall or 50 feet tall. And while they still come, they come further apart. You can see them coming. An anniversary, a birthday, a Christmas, a landing at O'Hare. You can see it coming for the most part and prepare yourself. And when it washes over you, you know that somehow you will again come out on the other side. Soaking wet, sputtering still hanging on to some tiny piece of the wreckage, but you'll come out. Take it from an old guy. The waves never stop coming, and somehow you don't really want them to, but you learn that you'll survive them, and other waves will come, and you'll survive them too. If you're lucky, you'll have lots of scars from lots of loves and a lots of shipwrecks. That's wisdom there. That's, now, that's somebody who's been around the block a few times, you know, but I, I read that, and I appreciate you letting me read that, because it shows that you can, you can find wisdom in this. Okay? You, can, you can find a healthy perspective to this reality of life. Okay? So there are practical benefits. Anything on that? Is your hand up, Jeff? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hmm. True. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. So, yeah, looking at the brevity of life, it gives you a chance to an analyze yourself and examine yourself and then. 
you know, see what more you want to do before you leave this world. Of course, understanding you're accountable to God. That's what Jeff was saying. So, very good point. Did you have your hand up, Faith? That is such a good statement. He's not telling us how to feel. He's telling us how to think, right? That is such a good statement. It really is. Because pain is real. The waves are real. And some of us know more than others. But there can be a healthy response to this. Okay, yeah, John. Not you. Your own opinion. About death. Right. That's, I mean, yeah. But I think you're saying we need to make, hmm, sir? Okay. So there is, there, is a, there is a good way to make peace with this, with the reality of death. And that kind of gets, blends into the spiritual side we're about to see. Yes, Johnny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. True. Exactly. That's true. If you're not a Christian, you're not prepared to meet this moment in life. But you're right. I mean, what Christ offers us and promises us should, should give us all the hope we need to meet this challenge. Because it's coming. You know what? I mean, there is a moment coming where you're going to be breathing your last few breaths. You're going to close your eyes for the last time. It's coming. We know it's coming. Unless the Lord returns in the clouds first. So right, when, when that moment comes, well, you need, now is the time to prepare for it. Now it is. You know, preparing for that moment to leave. Because that's when reality hits. It's on the other side of where we are. It's not here. <laughs> this is all temporary. So right, I mean, the, the, the promise is, that a Christian has should, should really comfort us and help us and give us courage for when that moment comes. And that's the spiritual side of this. Because, you know, Jesus came and did some things to make it possible for us to, to just approach this great enemy with confidence. In, in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So at the very least, we can see Jesus did something different for how we approach death. And I think that we understand it's the hope, you know, the victory. That the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if it wasn't for him, we couldn't approach death the way we should. As God's people. So there are spiritual benefits to death. There's practical benefits, but there's spiritual benefits. And the, the big one is you get to go and be with the Lord. That's, that's the huge benefit. Uh, here's what Revelation says. Revelation 14 and verse 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So here's the Bible's perspective. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. He qualifies it. We're all going to die, but blessed are those who die in the Lord. See, there's a condition to that. So why is that, though? Why is it blessed? 
Why, why should we consider it a blessing when someone dies in the Lord? No more pain and sorrow, the things, yeah, the things that we dread about death. No more pain and sorrow for them in this life. Did you have something? Right. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So that promise of going to paradise for God's people should be something that we anticipate. You know, that that's why we can look forward to the door of death and walk through it with Jesus because we made our peace with him we to the best of our ability put our faith in him and reconciled our relationship with him and as a result there's life on the other side of the door that that promise of paradise that people have been promised in, pa in times past so they may rest from their labors here that's a good thing and their works follow them and what that's referring to I think is better translated in the contemporary English where it says they will be rewarded for what they have done. And the Bible does say that in other places. You're going to be judged for what you do in this life, whether good or evil. And so here I think he's talking about the judgment for the good things. Did I see a hand back there? Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. So the Christian who's working in the fields, gathering souls for the Lord, sharing that word, that is the only work you can take with you in terms of the eternal value. So that's what we should be about, you know, helping other people get ready for this moment. And deep down inside, I think people know that. People know that this day's coming. And they do want to get ready in some sense. I'm sure that's there. That's where we come in. All right, so we should sorrow as people who have hope, is what Paul said to the Thessalonians. Sorrow as people who have hope. Uh, he says it this way in Philippians 1. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How about that? To die is gain. Well, I'm about to win, is what he's saying. When I die, I'm going to win. How in the world do you reach that perspective? How many, how, do you have that? Is that, your, is that your outlook? I think we have moments of that outlook. I don't know if it's always there on the front burner. But Paul was like, to me, I'm going to live. Whatever time I have, I'm going to live for Christ. But when I die, that's when it really gets good. Right? It's gain. Well, that, that requires some decision making. He says, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor, like the sister was talking about. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. And what he means by that is what I shall prefer. You know, if I had a choice, I cannot tell, you know, what, what I would want more than anything. Go ahead, brother. Yes, this is ultimately what faith is about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. That's true. You know, and that's the way it should be. That, you're right. That's the purpose of faith. You know, do we trust God to help us 
with our greatest enemy in this life, which is death. You know, and it gets down to our faith and whether or not we are making the choices for him over this world. You know, and he's, Paul's saying, look, if I stay here, it's good because I can do more good and help you out spiritually. But what I should choose, I cannot tell you. You know, what I would want more than anything, I can't tell you, or I can't tell myself. But he says, I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. I love that. To be with Christ, which is far better. What do you think he meant by that? That I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire. I want to be here to help you, but man, I want to go. Because that's going to be far better. Yes. Right, yeah. Yeah. Yes, comfortable. Good point. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah, because this man who wrote this was in prison. You know, he was in a dirty jail cell, you know, a dirt floor jail cell, whatever. But you're right, we're so comfortable, it's hard for us to, to embrace the concept you know, of something being better. But it is. It's going to be far better because you're going to depart and be with Christ. I, you know, that's a, that's a beautiful thought. He says it in another way, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8. Beautiful thought. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present when the Lord gets back to that separation business, you know, when your spirit separates from the body, your body dies. Well, you don't cease to exist. You go somewhere. You still exist. And that's what Paul's building on. He says, look, I'm looking forward to this. I, it's better because you get to go and be with the Lord. And that's the conflict he's describing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know, the, the contrast between the physical and the spiritual. We're always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then he says in verse 8, We are confident, yes, well, pleased rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. So there are some benefits to letting go of this thing, right? There's benefits for you, for you to not hold on to this, especially in going to be with the Lord. Yes, brother. Yeah. And it's kind of like this time of it's kind of like the showcase of the prize of Christ. I'll take door number two. Mm -hmm. No, it's not that. Yeah. You know, it's not just being gone spiritually. You know, you, you murder yourself. Right. And yeah. for for people who are not a believer in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. you know, some atheists are missing this. Mm -hmm. And it's good. Right. Because Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is something that uh, atheism, uh, agnosticism, they don't take hold of this because they don't have God on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, that's a real, it's a real struggle when people conclude that suicide is the better option, you know, to, to life. And ultimately, obviously, God's the, their judge. Um, but we shouldn't view it that way. We as God's people should not view life that way and death that way. That to us, that there's, if, if I live, it's great. If I die, it's really good. You know, that's the way Paul saw it. Johnny? I mean, How about that? Wow.
right. That's great. Yeah, and that's really what Paul was saying. Yeah. Very good, good observation. Because that's basically what Paul was saying, is that it's better for me to stay because more fruit from my labor and, and more beneficial to you spiritually. So, and you're 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 applying that to your grandchildren or younger people, which is good. Uh, yeah. What's your name? Oh, okay, Amy. Amy thank you. <laughs> I need closed captioning, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. I die daily. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Right. 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 That's true. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I, I wish people could have heard all that because I can't repeat it all. But you just gave a good summation of faith because that's what faith is. You know, you're building on that rock, that hope that Jesus gives. And you know what? Your life here may be cut short sooner than you want. That, that, that can happen. But we're here for the other side. You know, <laughs> We're here for the eternal side. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. 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 Day after day, right? Yeah. Right. We are. Yeah. Good point. That you know the the when we realize that <laughs> there is definitely. More sin at the lower part of the hourglass than on the top, and that we are just passing through. But see, we have to get our house in order, our our mind right, our heart right with God to approach it that way. Did you have something? Yes. Right. Right. That's true. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's good. And that's where that blessed are the, you know, those who die in the Lord. It, it's a precious memory to, to, for people to live in such a way that their, their funeral is a time to honor good judgment and not, like you said, walk on eggshells to, you know, avoid dealing with reality. Uh, so how can we know? Why should we know or why should we expect to exist after death? Why should we expect it? What do you say? 
Yes, David? Oh, we, good. We believe the witnesses. Right, 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 of, of, yes, the witnesses of Jesus being alive, you know, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Exactly. And that's, he gets into that in 1 Timothy about the mercy God showed him and how he was unworthy. But, you know, what you read there from Romans 8 and how nothing can separate us from the love of God, especially death. All right, put on your seatbelts. I've got to get through some stuff here. All right. The Bible gives a perspective that there is something else beyond this life, even in Ecclesiastes. Thus we return. To the earth as it was, the spirit will return to God who gave it. Okay, that's the Bible perspective. Even in the New Testament especially, you see, it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So, something else is coming, okay? There's accountability beyond the grave. It doesn't end here. <laughs> really, it's just beginning when you leave this life. Reality is. And then, like you all have mentioned, Jesus. You know, Jesus lived beyond the grave, especially in the resurrection, but even before he came back, he was somewhere. He didn't cease to exist. And the Bible says he went to Hades. His soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Well, his body did not return to dust because it was raised. But while he was separated from his body, his soul was in Hades. His soul was in Hades. That's the realm of the dead. Everybody goes to Hades is the Bible perspective. And so he was in Hades. He told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay? So that's referring to the comfort side of Hades. There's a comfort side and there's a torment side. And Luke 16 brings this out a little bit better. Where Lazarus was comforted in paradise, you know, where Jesus went. He was there. And the rich man was in the side of torment. But they're both in Hades. So Hades is paradise and torment. And between the two, there's a gulf that separates each side. You can't cross over, is what Jesus taught in Luke 16. All right, so this is where everybody goes. Everybody who's been here, everybody who's ever lived, that's where they are. Okay, you're going to go there. 
And what we see is that the torment side is a miserable side because you're still aware, you're still alert, you still exist, and you have things you can feel and think about, okay? Jesus taught this. And so that's what we can anticipate. That's why we can know there's more beyond the grave. Now, the challenge is in the King James, it says hell, okay, for Hades. And that's the challenge we have when we come to this, you know. And so just understand, I'll make copies of these things if you want them. But, uh, you know, he's still referring to the realm of the dead is what the term refers to. So don't get confused on um, him going to hell, okay, in Luke 16. He's going to Hades, all right? But Hades is not just the bad side, you know? That's how it's been used because of the King James Version, you know, going to Hades. Well, Hades is paradise as well, is what Jesus taught. That's where he went, okay? So what the Bible says is everybody's going to be raised from Hades in the end. You know, he's going to have a resurrection. Everyone who is in the grave is going to hear his voice Come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So, you know, the last part of Revelation 20 talks about that, where death and Hades are destroyed because it's going to be emptied out one day. And that's the judgment day, okay? When everybody's going to assemble before Christ. And he's going to separate the two. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and then that's that's when we get the judgment you know of heaven or hell and it's a day of sentencing really because when you die you already know right you're either going to torment or paradise so it's a day of sentencing really it's not like God has to make up his mind okay where, where's this guy going to go uh, no that's you know you, you're appointed to die once and after this the judgment so anyway you can know you're going to exist after you leave this body, okay, is what the Bible is teaching us. Now, the warning is not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to go to heaven, okay, but it's he who does the will of my Father in heaven because many are going to say, well, what about me? You know, I did a lot of good things for you, and he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Can you imagine anything more terrifying than that, than God saying, I don't even know you. Depart from me. That's a terrifying thought. But lawlessness is what will bring that about. So that's why we've got to have a heart that's ready to believe and obey and surrender. All right, so let me try and get this in if I may. What are some wrong ways people respond to death? Driven away from the Lord by it. That's a good point. Blame God. That's a good point, yes. So that, that's an unhealthy response. What hope enabled... Oh. What help enabled Paul to endure the trials of life? You all already mentioned it. He Sir? He knew, he knew where he was going. Right. You know, that gets back to that power of the witnesses. You know, he says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So this guy knew it's coming. It's coming because of what Jesus did. And that's what we can know, you know. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, The body, look, it's sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. He says in verse 46, The spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. That's what we're looking for. That eternal body made in the, like God. And so that's why he says, thanks be to God, victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the only way to respond to death. All right, friends, thank you for your good comments. I appreciate it.